America doesn't have enough CO2. Wait, that, that can't be right. The same CO2 that's heating our planet, the same way that we're looking to reduce. CO2 is at the backbone of your soda, your beer, your decaf, preserving your cheese and your steaks, special effects smoke, and of course, your champagne. Thousands of companies from breweries to CPG, they built their processes on this premise of an abundance of CO2. And now some of these companies are being forced to shut down because the price of merchant CO2, the one that's mostly used in the food industry, has spiked over the last few years. Wait, what? But can't we just pull more from the atmosphere? Actually, the answer to how America began running out of the right kind of CO2 is not simple, it's not floating around, it's partly buried in the earth and partly buried in government paperwork with one regulation that backfired tremendously but that some companies have actually used to their advantage. Either way, it looks like the ground has been shaken for these industries and they're gonna need to move really quickly or evaporate. Get it? Okay, let's get with the video. Okay, so the easy part first. Yes, what you've heard is correct. Our atmosphere does have too much CO2, and yes, that's still growing, and it's a problem. And I know that sounds contradictory to what I said earlier, but stick with me on this one, because the thing is, as a greenhouse gas, CO2 traps heat from the sun, and that raises the planet's temperature. Venus, for example, has an atmosphere that's made up of 96% CO2. That makes it the hottest planet in our solar system, even hotter than Mercury, despite the fact that Mercury is much more closer to the sun. Now look at the chart again. The scale on that vertical axis is parts per million because believe it or not, only about 0.042% of our atmosphere is CO2. So about 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen and the rest of it is mostly nitrogen really, which is gonna be crucial to our story, but I'm gonna get to that soon. So if you wanted to capture and sell the CO2 that's in the atmosphere, any CO2 that you sell is called merchant CO2, you essentially have to filter out like 99.9% .9 of the rest of the gas in the atmosphere just to get that tiny little bit of CO2. That's like distilling one teaspoon of sugar from a bathtub of water. Now for reference, a metric ton of liquid CO2, that's just a variety of merchant CO2, the stuff that we use in our fountain soda, costs almost 600 bucks in the US as of Q2 2025. This varies by region, by the way, but let's just keep 600 as a reference. Now, capturing that same metric ton of CO2 from the atmosphere with the latest technology available today is a really complex process that can cost over $1,000 per metric ton, which is not a great deal for your soda. So the bubbles in your soda have actually never come from the atmosphere or extracted from the atmosphere. And you have this dude to thank for that. In 1772, Joseph Priestley noticed that beer was naturally bubbly and it's because fermentation has two critical byproducts. One is alcohol and the other one is CO2. But in the late 1700s, nobody even knew that these bubbles were CO2. They just knew that beer produced this fixed air that was dissolved into the liquid. But people liked it, especially Priestley. So he started working on his own process to extract this fixed air from chalk, literally from blackboard chalk, to then capture it and then to impregnate water with it. This wasn't merchant CO2 that you could buy in tanks. This process was done directly into the water. And then this guy, JJ Schrepp, started a company a few years later to turn this process into a business. So he made bubbly water using Priestley's process and soda's popularity grew. CO2 wasn't just great for bubbles. We figured out with the invention of refrigeration that gases can be turned into liquids when cooled down and then into solids when cooled down even more and compressed, which gave us dry ice. Now, thanks to these discoveries, we get soda fountains that use pressurized CO2, liquid CO2, to carbonate drinks as they're poured. In the 1920s, shipping companies started using dry ice commercially to keep ice cream cold in shops, and by the early 1930s, to keep items cold in some rail cars. And of course, for fog in movies. Also in the 1920s, we figured out that packaging certain types of produce in high CO2 environments helped preserve it for longer. And decaf, one of the most popular ways to remove caffeine from coffee beans, is using CO2. Also, bacon. Meats are often packaged with MAP, that's modified atmosphere packaging that has extra CO2 that makes the meat look redder, but also stay fresh for longer. So yeah, CO2 made it everywhere in the food industry. And how we sourced it also evolved with time from chalk to corn. But understanding that journey is crucial to understanding why we're running out. So let's add that to the timeline. Up until the 1800s, companies mostly followed Priestley's process, chalk plus acid, which directly impregnated the water. Some CO2 started to be collected at breweries as a byproduct of fermentation. 
Now, as the oil and gas industry expanded in the early 1900s, drilling sometimes hit these gas pockets that turned out to be almost pure CO2 that was trapped in these domes underground. Jackson Dome in Mississippi is a major deposit in the US, at some point supplying up to 4% of all merchant CO2 in the States. And then there's ammonia, which is the backbone of many fertilizers. One of the most common processes to produce ammonia also yields CO2 as a byproduct. And finally, ethanol. Because just like beer, fermenting corn for ethanol creates a lot of CO2, and ethanol production grew a lot in the 2010s. So all of these processes release CO2, which then gets captured and then purified, usually by a partner plant that sits next door. They literally call this over the fence. And this partner plant usually purifies it, refrigerates it to turn it into liquid CO2, and then packages it into the storage tanks. And finally, these partner plants have to find distribution companies that transport it and deliver the tanks to wherever they're going. In the US today, this is where the bubbles in your Coke come from. For decades, we've had this symbiotic relationship between excess CO2 from these industries and the CO2 that the food and beverage industry needed. But the balance cracked around 2022, and the last few years have brought regional shortages and price spikes for supply chains that depend on CO2. By the way, the Hustle team is kind of fascinated by supply chains and the hidden business opportunities that they create. I only learn about this story from the newsletter itself, which hits about 1 million inboxes every day. It's completely free, and you can subscribe by just snatching this QR code here, or I'll just drop the link in the bio. Now back to CO2. One of the first problems started in Jackson Dome, where CO2 output has been dropping for years. The U.S. is currently experiencing a shortage of carbon dioxide, in part because of contamination at a production hub in Mississippi. Turns out that the concentration of benzene and ethane in the CO2 was too high, so it didn't pass the FDA standard to be used in food. It's not clear why this happened, though, because benzene and ethane, they occur naturally, and trace amounts could always be found in CO2. But something caused them to spike, perhaps drilling, or the way the mine was managed, or simply a geological shift. But that's just one of the many sources. How about the others? Well, add to that, the pandemic lockdown. Since people essentially didn't drive for a year, ethanol production dwindled, which also put a crunch on this CO2 byproduct. And beyond that, ethanol production isn't really growing, or at least not as fast as CO2 demand. By 2022, you could actually see this in the market. Many small breweries faced CO2 shortages, price spikes, production pauses. Some were even forced to shut down. Now remember, beer produces some CO2 as part of the fermentation process, but breweries also add extra pressurized CO2 to the beer to make it more foamy and to give it body. And CO2 is also used to purge or to clean equipment of oxygen and stop the fermentation. So to microbreweries, sharp CO2 spikes and these tight allocations and shortages, they were just devastating. And then dry ice is also putting a strain in the market because e-groceries and meal kits often require dry ice for shipment. Medication too. Some vaccines need to be transported in cold temperatures. So the demand for dry ice has been growing about 5% year over year, according to Gas World, but not the supply of CO2. And next, ammonia. Now, the usual process to produce ammonia, the one that we've used for decades, is called gray ammonia and requires some natural gas. And improving how ammonia production works is a really low-hanging fruit way to cut carbon emissions. So a new process called green ammonia has been getting a lot of traction in the last few years. And this is all great for the planet, but it's really terrible for the industries that rely on merchant CO2. And maybe the most critical shift in this industry comes from ethanol and this fatal oversight in government policy. The straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, or the empty CO2 tank that... Never mind. And here's the problem. This is the Section 45Q tax credit for carbon sequestration. It was originally updated in 2018, and it provides a credit for CO2 that's captured and sequestered that would have been otherwise released into the atmosphere if not for the qualifying equipment. In other words, if you have this process in your factory, a process that generates a ton of CO2 that would normally go to the atmosphere, and instead of venting it out, you capture it and you sequester it, aka you bury it underground, you get a tax credit. Now, there are much better credits for DAC, direct air capture, but if you're sequestering carbon that hasn't hit the atmosphere yet, the 2025 credit is about $85 per metric ton. Now, hold on, didn't we say that the price of merchant CO2 was like, 600 bucks per metric ton? Why would you take 85 when you can make 600? Well, because those companies, they aren't making 600 bucks a pop. Get it? 
Anyway, the, the ethanol plant that sells CO2 over the fence to then go to a distributor to then make it to soda, they're only getting a fraction of that. To plenty of ethanol plants, it's a much better deal to sequester this CO2, claim the tax credit, than to get into this whole supply chain mess. And very much by accident, this 45Q tax credit and other similar carbon reduction credits from other countries around the world created this new disruption in an already strained system. It's a strain that has raised the pressure <laughs> Okay, that's, that's enough puns, I'm sorry. It's a strain that has made merchant CO2 really expensive. But that has also forced the industry to think outside the box a bit, which has created some exciting opportunities. For example, breweries have started switching to using nitrogen for a bunch of different processes like the pour. The big difference is that bubble size. Nitrogen is gonna be a lot smaller, so you get those that tighter foam head on there and also it lends that creamy feeling that you get. CO2 is just bigger bubbles. And even during the manufacturing process, nitrogen can replace CO2 that was normally used to purge tanks, which significantly reduces the amount of CO2 that they would require otherwise. Nitrogen, of course, is much more abundant and therefore cheaper, and it fits some parts of the wine and the beer industries perfectly. And those smaller, smoother, velvety nitro bubbles also work great for coffee, hence nitro cold brew. And maybe the most exciting alternative is recouping brewery fermentation gas. For example, this company, Dalum, developed a system that captures the CO2 that the beer fermentation produces and allows the brewery to reuse it. I just think this whole story is a reminder of how seemingly beneficial changes in one industry can have devastating effects in another, but on the bright side, also have them reinvent themselves for the better. Kind of like how used cooking oil, another byproduct of the food industry that accidentally became a hot commodity, is now worth more than crude oil itself. I made a whole video about it if you want to check it out. And also don't forget to subscribe to the Hustle newsletter right here or in the description for more business stories like this one in your inbox every day. Catch you on the next one.